From the Tiger Cats Audio Network, this is Tiger Cats Game Day with Courtney Steven and Mike Daly. Welcome to Tiger Cats Game Day on the Tiger Cats Audio Network. My name is Courtney Steven, joined as always by the man himself, Mike Daly. Mike, this is this is almost. It's, it's almost it's not Labor Day, but this is what we have been waiting for. The people of Hamilton are traveling down that QEW eastbound to BMO Field because the Tiger Cats, the two and five Hamilton Tiger Cats, are facing off against the arch rivals in double blue, the Toronto Argos, who are first in the East Division with a three and three record. Mike, they are they're the favorites on paper, kind of. Yeah, um, but if you can call it that. I, I'm not sure if you can really say that the Argos are running away with the East, even though they are in first place. How do the Thai Cats feel headed into this one? Well, let's not forget that every time the Thai Cats head down to BMO Field, it's a home game. The, there's going to be more Thai Cat fans there than there are going to be Argos fans. So that's can that's always a boost for the Thai Cats. That's why it's you know the home away from home type thing. In terms of the favorites, yeah, you can't really say that the Argos are, are favorites in this because it it almost seems like when you look at these teams from a five hundred thousand foot perspective, they're almost the same. It's like this Jekyll and Hyde of you know being able to put together great offensive drives, a lot of you know a lot of stats lead the league in certain pass like passing yards stuff like that but then just can't win a game it's almost like you look at this and you go what's going on with these teams you know what i mean so I, i'm kind of excited to see how this plays out especially over the the next five weeks because i mean that's hard to do play a team four times out of five weeks and just how that means for game planning wise how that means mentally on each player um, you know, if you don't want to, it's going to be a, a case of not taking a 15 yard penalty every play, because I've now seen this guy that I'm <laughs> lining up against for 27 snaps in a row. And then it's going to be another 27. That's going to be another, you know what I mean? And it's like, that's this weird situation that the tie cats and Argos are getting themselves into now. Hey, but thank, thankfully, we can thank the schedule makers at the CFL for adding a little bit of drama to the 2022 season. There will be six, well, five more East Division games in a row. The Ticats already took place of the first one against Montreal at home at Tim Hortons Field last week. The Argos, they didn't do so well in their last match. They lost to the previously winless Ottawa Red Blacks. So the East Division is really a neck-and-neck neck battle. If the Ticats are able to beat the Argos today, then the Ticats would now have three wins. They would have the up on the Argos. But the Argos have played less games than everybody, so they might be a little bit fresher. Let's talk about the people who are in these lineups uh, today that we're going to see on the field. There's some very notable ones, but let, let's just start with... Uh, Put people returning home, and and I might not be talking about who you think about. I'm talking about wide receiver Mike Jones, who just joined the Tie Cats from Edmonton. This is a plug and play guy. When Tyler Tarnowski goes down, you need another Canadian receiver. Mike Jones has played in Tommy Condell's system, so they sign him, and literally three days later, he's starting. But it's not as much of an adjustment as you might think because he's had reps in this system. How how key is it that the person they picked up actually has experience? Do you think that um, that gives them another lift that allows them to just keep chugging along? Because the Tigers do have some momentum right now. Yeah, like that's that was kind of a no question pick. Once, once they ended up putting him in, you could realize that he would be able to play right away because like you said, he had that experience with Tommy's offense. I don't think there's as much of an adjustment for him coming in and, and Mike's going to be able to pick up that offense quickly where it's going to mess up or maybe where you'll see some learning curves is just on the timing of things, right? Don't forget, he was in Edmonton the whole year. That's a completely different offense than what Dane and Tommy are running here. So, you know, we, we're going to look to see him understand the offense, 
But in terms of the execution and stuff like that, maybe they'll be off maybe one or two plays. But it's really, like you said, plug and play. That's probably the best pickup you can have from a free agent signing to come in, somebody that's familiar with the offense, familiar with Dane, familiar with teammates around him, and be able to go in there and help out where they have a need with Tyler going down. That, that's a huge pickup for them, big time. Absolutely. And another uh, pickup or somebody who they bumped up off of the injured list back to active, it is – I don't know what you call him. Simi Ho, <laughs> Simone Lawrence, number 21. Yeah. The guy who has had his best games in his career playing against the Argos. I dug into the archives. I, I felt it because, you know, when I played on the team and I was with him, I knew that when we went to BMO, he was going to light it up. But I, I wanted to see if there was any stats to back it up. And indeed, in 146 games, Simone Lawrence has 14 interceptions. That's about one every 10 games. But five out of those 14 have come against the Argos. So, you know, one third of those. And so he's kind of excited, to say the least. You know, he's a guy who it embraces the rivalry. He's a guy who represents Hamilton to the fullest and Part of representing Hamilton is understanding how much playing against the Argos really means to all of those fans from the Hammer. What does the return of Simone Lawrence do to energize his team at such a critical time in the season when they might be hitting their stride? Yeah, you said it perfectly. It's energize that team. That's exactly what Simone Lawrence does. He, he's able to get in here and fire up everybody around him. Right, Everybody has a little bit more trust everybody has a little bit more pep in their step whatever it might be with Simone out there because you know he's going to play hard you know he's going to hit people in the face he's going to run or fly around the field he's going to make plays all over the place having Simone Lawrence back is, is huge and not to take anything away from Kyle Wilson because I thought Kyle Wilson played awesome when Simone was hurt he did great yeah I thought great. Kyle did awesome but having Simone back he's that Hall of Fame caliber player uh, he can make plays all over the field but going on to that and adding on to that, the, the life of an American football player on this roster is Simone Lawrence comes back from injury. Kyle Wilson now becomes that designated import spot, right? That designated impact that we talk about where he's going to be on the special teams. You're going to see him flying around. He'll still be making plays all over the place and, and having his presence felt. But then you look at the back end with, with Alden Darby, right? And now Alden Darby has to come off the roster because that designated import spot is Kyle Wilson. So we're not going to see Alden Darby, but that's the life of an American player in the CFL is, you know, Alden Darby goes out there and makes a bunch of plays, end up seeing him on special teams. He made a huge kickoff tackle and, and, you know, was very effective on special teams. But that's the life of the CFL. And so we'll see Alden Darby. He'll, he'll take a seat for this time. But, you know, down the road we're going to need him right back. I think this is one of those situations where uh, when the naturalized Canadian status kicks in, uh, your, your roster gets a little bit more flexible. But that's a podcast for another <laughs> season. Let's talk about more of these these double blue guys. We talk about the, the Tiger Cats every single week. So if you listen to Tiger Cats game day, you should be familiar with the back end because it hasn't changed. With the D-line because it hasn't changed. They put up five sacks mm-hmm. last week. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. But... Um, Let's talk about this this Argos defense. I think that Winton McManus, who plays the same position as Simone Lawrence on the other team, I think he's a guy to watch. Came over from Calgary, as so many of these players in Ryan Dinwiddie's team did. And in only six games, the rest of the league has played eight. In six games, he has 36 tackles that has him at sixth in the league. He also has scored a touchdown um, he's just he's just all over the field making plays, disrupting things. They've got Sean Oakman, who's another big presence in the middle of that D-line. Of course, Enoch Mwamba. Um, just a, a lot of different players over there. For the Ticats team, that's, they've been moving the ball, like you mentioned, but haven't been able to put it in the end zone as frequently as they want. Is this a defense that they match up well against, or is this defense going to be uh, giving them some gray hair today. Yeah, I think this defense is, you know, one of the tougher ones that 
you're going to come across because just, and this is on paper, you look at their D-line, and their D-line is making plays all over the field, right? We know J.G. Garrett Davis. We know what he's able to do, right? He's kind of a game-breaker out there. He's, you know, able to make every offensive lineman miss. Sean Oakman is the biggest man on the field at all times. Planet. <laughs> Planet. Planet, yeah, fair. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Maybe him and Willie Jefferson will be the first ones we send out to greet the aliens, but... I mean, <laughs> these guys, these guys, Sean Oakman is, is huge, and he is making plays all over the field. And then Shane Ray on the other end, he's making a ton of plays. So that's that right there. When you have a D line that is effective like they are, it's going to make everything harder because what they're able to do is they're able to drop all their other guys, the linebackers and DBs into coverage, and be able to fill zones or double team guys that are getting the ball more. When you can get pressure with four, that's what you end up seeing defenses doing really well. So I think the Argos have that in them where they can rush the flooring, they can get pressure on the passer. But it's going to be, it's going to be a tough matchup for, for this uh, tie Cats offense because it is a good back end. It is a good linebacker core. You know, a lot of games played. Um, it'll just be kind of, you know, stay consistent, take what's available, and, and move down the field. But I, I do think that D-line is going to be a little bit of a problem. Right. And on the other side of the ball, on the Toronto offense, McLeod Bethel Thompson, I think he recently moved into the top five for all time passing yards for an Argo, which was a surprising stat to me because I felt like, you know, had he been there that long? But hey, this is a guy who's been quietly doing his thing for a few years now, and he's going to be with Eric Rogers, DeVaris Daniels. Markeith Ambles, and the most dangerous of all, the Canadian Curly Gittins Jr., who leads the team in targets, yards, yak, second down catches, almost every single category except touchdowns. What 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 is happening here that Speedy B, Brandon Banks, is not listed in the starting lineup among, uh, you know, a league of guys who each of them has been great at a point in time, but... Is Speedy Banks not not great enough to be in that starting lineup? Yeah, I saw that. And, you know, what I'm kind of thinking is you're going to see him at kick returner, punt returner, doing that kind of stuff. But with Eric Rogers back, I mean, you know, you and I know Eric Rogers well. He is a big body. And it's tough to replace mm-hmm. what he can do down the field. He can run some pretty nice routes, but he's that big body receiver where you have a ton of range to be able to throw the ball wherever you want. He'll go up and get it. Um, I guess, you know, Phillips has played well for them. I know he's made a lot of plays, so that would be kind of the spot where you would look at Speedy filling in. But, yeah, it's that weird world of they are so loaded at receiver that the the odd man out. And I don't think you're not going to see Speedy in the offense. I think he's going to be in that offense. You're going to see packages in for him. He'll fill in when guys get tired, whatever it is. But you'll see him predominantly, I think, on punt return and kickoff return, which he's very, very, very familiar with, as Ticat fans know. But what I want to throw back to you is when you have a receiver that's typically that Z receiver, that wide side number one receiver like Curly Giddens, getting all of those targets, all of those catches, leading the league, what does that do for you as a defense or as a DB crew where you're like, whoa, 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 this guy leads us? It's – it, it discombobulates you. It definitely <laughs> throws yeah. you off because they they made a whole rule in the CFL by let's move the hashes in because the Z never gets involved. And Curly was sitting in the back of that meeting taking notes like, okay, so I'm going to get some extra action this year, huh? And you know what? It's not every game. It's re- Actually, it's never when the main guy on the scouting report is playing – to that wide side static on the line receiver position but hey this guy's just been getting it done so you know by hook or by crook he's gonna get a lot of action he's getting the most targets which means that either they're calling it for him or he's getting to the space so with a guy like eric rogers coming back like he said big you could pass the ball you know two yards off target and he could still grab it because he's about six four with a humongous catch radius but a guy like Curly is going to get his just because that's the way that the offense is designed and they've been running through him. He's a guy who can get the ball and they get a few extra yards. 
I think this will be a, um, a great game for Siante Evans to kind of jump onto the radar this season. Siante is a veteran guy who's been playing in this league, making a lot of plays. But at that field side, you might not get as much action. In this game, he's going to see at least five, six uh, attempts towards his direction. And I think maybe that's a chance for us to, to say Siante Evans' name a few more times uh, this week. So that that's that would be my approach to it. If I was if I was Siante, if I was Richard Leonard to that field side, maybe we get into some zone coverages. I'm not just sloughing off and, and and thinking this guy's a decoy. I'm actually licking my chops and thinking we might get action. We might have some action finally to the field side. Yeah, and that's the thing. Like usually that field corner spot is just another roaming player because you know that that Z receiver, the one out wide on the field side there, isn't going to get the ball all that much. But uh, give it to McLeod Bethel Thompson. He gets through his reads quick and, you know, finds Curly when he when it's a primary, but he'll also find him on that check down when it's, nope, don't have anything, don't have anything. Oh, there he is, get that thing out there. And I think that's kind of where Curly's made his hay. But listen, let's move on to some of the trends for this game mm -hmm. and you know where the Argos and the tie cats are going to line up and it's not necessarily for you know it is this game because this is the first game this is the first game you need to win but because mm -hmm. they're going to see each other so often where do you feel these teams what do you think they need to do with this game to set up the other games or do they do that at all do they have any setup with this game to those other games? Do they hold plays back? Do they get them all out there? Do you win one at a time? How, how do you approach this as a seasoned coach like Orlando Steinar will mm -hmm. have to approach this? I think that you try to keep certain trends continuing and you try to break the ones that are not favorable to you. More specifically, Toronto is dead last in the CFL in first quarter scoring. In point differential, they are negative 30. They've only scored 10 points in the first quarter in their six games. So what I think the Ticats do is they open up the playbook a little bit more early on and try to really jump on the Argos. So they, they might just let that thing fly on the first play of the game downfield and just be greedy and just try to set the pace of what this is going to be. And if they're able to do that successfully, then what that immediately does is it puts Toronto on their heels. They're not a lot, they're not able to call as many run plays because we know they have a guy named Andrew Harris who tends to be either very hot or he's he's out to lunch. <laughs> he's one or the other. He's either rushing for 150 yards on you or you're playing against Ottawa and you're you're finishing with 17 total rush yards. And, and we know what that result was. So the ability to take away Toronto's run game and make them fight you with one hand, that would be a huge advantage for the Hamilton Tiger Cats in this one. I think you do it by just going for the jugular early and, and trying to throw that thing up there. They've got some great weapons now. Braylon Addison, who before last night's game with Ottawa um, and Calgary, he is leading the league with 35 receptions. And then Tim White right behind him has 33. Um, do you think it's, it's the Braylon Addison show that it, it continues this trend of him getting so many targets? Does that continue? Or now that they had to put in a brand new guy, a Canadian, do they mix it up a little bit? And do we see more of the two backs? Do we see more of Jake Burt finally? Is he going to get into the mix and, you know, catch a little bit? Because really, if we talk, if we talk about it, Jake Burke's strength is not that he's a uh, get in there and, and block a D end. I mean, he can, he's big enough, but he's an athletic fullback. Like he can get out there, run a route and catch the ball. So do you think we see more two back or do you think that they line up five R like Tommy Condell likes to, and, and they keep feeding Braylon Addison all day? I think you see some two back, but I think what is going to end up seeing and, and, you know, maybe you can, chime in on this a little bit but with this tie cats run game it almost seems like it's moving to a, a dane and schiltz run game right which is wild to think that that's where they're going right now with them at you know number one and number two in rushing for the tie cats 
but it's effective. We've seen Schultz be able to run the ball, and I think that's where you're going to see that two back come in, is be able to just, you know, almost smoke and mirrors. As soon as you can get that quarterback running the ball, you're able to do so much with it, whether it's, you know, fake pulling a guard or pulling a fullback out to the flat to get guys out of the box and run it the opposite direction, whatever it might be. I think that's where you'll see that two back stuff come in, but I don't really see I don't really see Jake Burt being effective as a pass catcher until they are effective running the ball with the two back formation in. Right? Because I think as soon as they get him brought in and until you show that you are going to be able to march the ball down running the ball getting good yard per carry whatever it might be in that two back formation, then you'll be able to see some plays coming off of it, which I think will open up the offense a little bit, but in terms of Braylon Addison, he's that guy. He's the the drive continuer because what he mm. does so well is he can catch a three-yard, four-yard hook, make one guy miss, make another guy hit him, but him fall forward, bounce off. Next thing you know, he's got nine, ten yards. He's turned now a yeah. three-yard hook into three missed tackles and 11 yards, right? And I think yeah, that's that, – that, that creates confidence for the quarterback. And it keeps those drives going, right? So when we talk about – field goals or scoring touchdowns that gets you down there closer 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 so I do think you're going to continually see a heavy dose of Braylon Addison in this Ty Cats offense rightfully so and on that Ty Cats defense five sacks last week cannot be ignored this is something that had a huge impact on the way the back end played and how the opposing offense played and with Toronto's offensive line a little beaten up right now Dejon Allen, the uh, the right tackle, he's out of the starting lineup, and so they're going to be playing Shane Richards in his place. Um, and then you have a, a guy who's starting his second game, McKellar at left guard. You got, you know, some some holes, and we've experienced that on our end in Hamilton uh, with rotations in the offensive line and how that can be tough. Tie cats, do they come out and and just light them up, cover zero? Uh, you know, blitzing, putting pressure on McLeod Bethel Thompson, flushing him out of the pocket. It, do we see that high power defense gnash in its teeth, or are they sitting back and and forcing them to be surgical and dissect? What's the approach for the Ty Cats defense in this one? I mean, I think when you look at the Argos offense, there's two ar- there's two Two offenses that are going to show up. The one where McLeod Bethel Thompson is going to throw 400 yards and three touchdowns with no interceptions. Or the one where he's going to show up and it's like the exactly how you talked about the Andrew Harris. He's going to show up and have, you know, under 200 yards, three interceptions, and he's going to be rattled. So I think when you look at this team, you go, all right, we want to get after these guys early. Right? We want to make him uncomfortable back there so he can't sit there. And exactly like I talked about, Look to Eric Rogers. Look to Tavares Downs and say, nope, don't like it. Where's Curly? Boom, hit Curly, and then Curly takes a yak, and he's out of there, right? I think what you want to do is you want to get at him early, make him uncomfortable back there, and make him start making those decisions where it's like, you know, McLeod Bethel Thompson should be a, a top quarterback in this league for all the years that he's played, but there's just always that shadow of him, and I think that's because of the pressure that gets to him. It's the the trying to force a ball in there you know what I mean the gunslinger mentality as some of would would hear about it so I think you see the pressure early and then figure out how that's going but I am happy that this D line that this D line of the Thai Cats is getting some confidence back especially with that last game because we're going to need them down the stretch and they're very good and are good enough to do that every game but it needs to show up and show up and show up and we'll see that this game Speaking of a guy who's going to show up, one of my key matchups that I'm watching, Dylan Wynn versus Justin Lawrence, who plays center for, I was going to say the Calgary Stampeders, because seven out of these start, seven of these starters over here played in Calgary uh, recently. But no, he plays for the Toronto Argos, Justin Lawrence. He's going to have to anchor that offensive line at the center position, especially with a young guy next to him. You know, the center and guard, they often play in tandem against these D tackles. And hey, this this Dylan Wynn, he's a guy who makes this thing go. I know you also got Micah Johnson, who is not at all to be slept on, 
but I really think it starts with the center on the offensive line for the Argos. He's the main communicator. He's the one who's calling the protections. He's the one who has to touch the ball every single play and make sure it successfully gets in the hands of MBT. Do you see Dylan Wynn licking his chops thinking that this is a great opportunity? Or is this a, is this a fair fight? Is this a one-for-one matchup? I know if we had uh, Dylan Wynn on this podcast right now with us and we said, hey, are you licking your chops? Yo, I don't care who's over there. I'm going to beat you know, a bunch of swear words that end up coming out and stuff like that. <laughs> so I think, you know, Dylan Wynn, I don't think he's worried about who's across from him because he is just that good where it's the fact that, you know what I mean, whoever wants to come block me is going to get it. And I, you're absolutely right. He is the thing that makes this, this defense tick. And I know as a center, especially a new center, looking – looking up there and saying, okay, I got to snap the ball to my quarterback and then I have to block him mm-hmm. or look over to the other side and see Micah Johnson say, or him. I, I think there are both. options. <laughs> that's what I have to do today. <laughs> okay. I think that's what's going to end up happening is where, you know, they're both going to be licking their chops, just saying, okay, come on over, come on over. Yeah. Come on over this way next time. So I'm looking forward to it. But the one matchup that I am, looking forward to and this is you know a tale as old as time and these guys know each other very very well and a perfect time for Simone Lawrence to be put back into the matchup to face Andrew Harris because if we know anything about Simone Lawrence and Andrew Harris anybody that's ever heard any interview anything like that has talked to Simone these guys do not like each other they don't send each other Christmas cards (laughs) <laughs> I think they send each other Christmas stuff, but it's nothing nice and nothing card wise. And <laughs> might be a block of coal or something else <laughs> that we can't talk about. But nonetheless, these two going at it. I mean, over their their careers, their both of their Hall of Fame careers, these two have gone at it time and time and time again. So what a perfect time for Simone to be brought back to. The Argos field where Andrew Harris is now in Argo. Mm-hmm. And Simone gets to take part of his hatred for the Argos, part of his hatred for Aaron, Andrew Harris, and bring out all the energy that he's built up over the past injury bit. Oh. To, to, it's going to absolutely try to light Andrew Harris it's up. It's going to be marvelous. And here's one thing to look out for, Ty Cats fans. I, don't, I, I haven't watched any practice, so I'm not – uh, releasing any untold information. This might not even happen, but if I'm the defensive coordinator, I'm calling five down fronts, meaning I'm taking my Mike linebacker and I'm walking him up in the middle of the line of scrimmage or putting him on the edge. And that's going to force the Toronto offensive line to play man to man, five on five, the 4D lineman plus the mic. Everybody's going to have to call one person to block and that would leave Simone Lawrence and Andrew Harris one-on-one. You pick a gap, I pick a gap. Old school, grade eight football. We meet in the tunnel. This is what I'm looking forward to most. When they go five down and they just play man behind it, it's the only two guys left in the stadium. It's going to be 21 versus 33. Ooh, I'm ready. <laughs> That gave me goosebumps right there. I like it. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. Mike, so what's what's the what's the key storyline for this one? What do the Tie Cats have to do to win this game? Yeah, I think when you're gonna look at this at the end of the game, you gotta see if they are able to convert those red zone opportunities. Like we had said before, this is this is absolutely key. They right now, the Tie Cats, are converting only thirty three percent of their red zone opportunities in touchdowns. And that's the 20 yard. And usually when we talk red zone, you know, we'll talk where a field goal is able to meet. So 35 and out. But when you get within that 20 and you're only converting 33% of those plays into touchdowns, I think that's what's really going to separate this Tie Cats team as it goes down the road is being able to turn those opportunities into touchdowns. And instead of making them close games, you know, whether they've won or lost them in the past, they aren't close games anymore. Right, you've now shut this team out. You've now closed them out after putting a ton of points up on them in the first half because the Argos start slow. Close those out, get those into touchdowns. I think that's going to be the most key in this game is to be able to get the ball in the end zone and blow this team out of the water. 
and not keep it close, and especially not into the fourth quarter. How about you? What yeah. do you what do you see as being one of the key storylines for this game? No, I'd have to agree, and and for me, that is a one hundred percent true. But it starts on the defensive side. They had five sacks and they gave up zero. They were forcing turnovers and they were causing havoc. And if you're able to get the other team to go off script and take at least one or two pages out of that playbook that they prepared for all week that they spent reps on and just throw that out, then you're giving yourself an advantage. I think that's how this game begins. I think the Ticats come out guns blazing on defense. And I think that sets up the momentum, maybe some short fields, uh, maybe better field position by not allowing Toronto to continue drives and, and move the ball into Hamilton territory. I think that if this defense shows up early, makes plays, creates pressure, forces turnovers, that will trickle over into the offense and that will give Dane more opportunities and better field position to try and convert on exactly what you were talking about those scoring chances so 7 p.m bmo field turn on the lights it's the two and five hamilton tiger cats against the three and three toronto argonauts if you can't make it to to you can always turn on the tie cats audio network bubba and andy will have the pregame at six rj and luke will have the game call at 7 p.m for you we appreciate you tuning in it's always fun to talk football with you, Tiger Town. But until next time, for Mike Daly, and Courtney Steven. Catch you later. It's game day and you're ready. So are we. Let us know your thoughts. Email us at game day at Courtney Steven and Mike Daly are here every game day with their insights into today's.